The Lord is risen. Ah, indeed, he is risen. Welcome to Ferndale this morning. How wonderful to be together on Easter Sunday. And uh, welcome if you're a guest with us. We're particularly delighted to have you here. And uh, pray that you'll love Christ more as a result of being here today. Thank, thank you to the worship team. Thank you for the choice of great songs and uh, great music. How wonderful to be able to give expression to our love for Christ in songs. That's what the Bible says we should do. And uh, what a joy to be able to, to do that this morning. I'd like you to turn in, the, in your Bible, if you've got it on your phone or in a version like I've got in front of me. John chapter 20, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And uh, John was an eyewitness to the resurrection. He was there. And so his testimony is of particular importance and significance. John chapter 20. After lovingly laying the bound body of the Lord Jesus in Joseph's cave-like new garden tomb, Joseph and Nicodemus, no doubt with the help of others, rolled that huge stone in front of the entrance. While at a distance, Mary Magdalene and another woman also by the name of Mary watched what was happening. They knew where the grave was. And then they all scurried home. They had to be home by six o'clock because that is when Passover began. This was a special Sabbath, but not special for the followers of Jesus. They were distraught, they were devastated, they were confused, they were disappointed. It was a dark day. Their Lord was dead, their hopes were shattered, their faces were tear-stained, and they felt empty. Like you feel when you go home after a funeral. Now what? Two days earlier in the upper room, Jesus had promised, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. But even if they'd recalled that promise, they didn't understand what it meant on that dark day. It was Saturday. But Sunday was coming. And unbeknown to them, the old creation was at an end and the new creation was about to dawn. And early on Sunday morning, that first day of God's new week, he did come, he came to them and he came to the world. And he came by way of resurrection. That wonderful New Testament scholar, Anglican N.T. Wright, says, ask people around the world what they think is the biggest day of the year for Christians. Most will say Christmas. The true answer is Easter. If it hadn't been for Easter, nobody would think of celebrating Christmas. This is the first day of God's new week. The darkness is gone and the sun is shining. Resurrection. And this is the story of John chapter 20, verses 1 to 29. And uh, in this passage, we behold, our, our Easter theme is behold your king. And in this passage, we behold our king alive and involved in chapter 
20 verses 1 to 10, we see our king alive and we'll explore some of the evidence of the resurrection in those first 10 verses of the chapter. And then in verses 11 to 29, and we're not going to dig too deep into that, but we will see our king is involved. And uh, we'll see that in three encounters that he had with people. So let's think first of all, let me just focus our attention on verses 1 to 10. And these verses just exclaim very loudly that our king is alive. And we pr provide us with evidence of the resurrection. As I said, it's important that we remember that John, the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, the letters of John, and the book of the Revelation, that John is the writer here, and John was there. He was one of Jesus' disciples. He was an eyewitness. He was in the upper room. He was, the eyewit he was an eyewitness to the trial. He was an eyewitness to the crucifixion. And he's an eyewitness again to the resurrection. And what we have here is history. And uh, if anyone calls himself a historian and they don't believe in the resurrection, they have to have a different definition of history because what we have here is history. The passage shows that the resurrection happened in real space and time. The place was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea in Jerusalem. Familiar people were involved, John, Peter, Mary Magdalene. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, John chapter 19, verse 14. And his resurrection was set on the first day of the week. The text says that. Following Passover in the year A.D. 33. So the resurrection is not a man-made myth. It's a historical fact. It happened in, to real people in space and time and can be proved by the normal methods of historical analysis. And it was also witnessed by reliable people. Now, the chapter opens as we meet Mary Magdalene. Look at the text early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Mary's devotion is the, is the first thing that stands out. It was Mary's love that on Friday brought her to the cross, and it was Mary's love on Sunday that brought her to the tomb. Why did she love Jesus so much? Well, it's because he had changed her life. We read in Luke chapter 8, verse 2, that before her meeting Christ, she was possessed by seven devils. She was a demon-possessed woman, and we re see enough examples of demon possession in the Gospels to know that demon-possessed people were were unhappy people, they were disturbed, they were distraught, they were miserable people, indescribably so, they lived in a kind of a hell. And that was, that was Mary Magdalene, until she met Jesus. And he changed her life forever. Set her free from that bondage, and from then on she, she joyfully followed him and served him all the way to the cross and now to his grave. And on Easter Sunday morning, she, she went to the grave to mourn. She wanted to be near him, even though he was dead. And some of you understand that. If you've lost a loved one, sometimes you, you just want to go to the grave. You know they're not there, but there's, there's something about that place that you, you just want to be there. And then we come to Mary's discovery uh, in the text, when she arrived at the tomb at the dove gray light of the early morning, the text says in, that she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. There was no mistake, it was the right tomb, because on, fr on, uh, on, on Friday night, 
she was there watching. Some, some people say, oh, they, these women went to the wrong tomb. You know, they were so confused. No, no, they were there on Friday. They knew what tomb it was. And so Sunday morning, while it was still dark, she goes back to the tomb. And when she got there, she noticed that the stone, that heavy stone at the entrance to the cave that was the, the grave of Jesus had had been removed. And uh, she, the text says she looked inside. She didn't go inside, but she, but she looked inside. And then we see her distress. Look at verse 2. It's evident. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. You know, just when she thought things couldn't get worse, they did. The body was gone. Writer Ken Geyer says, as she runs to tell the disciples, a legion of questions haunts her. Who took the body? The Roman government? The religious leaders? And why? What would they want with it? Have they given him a criminal's burial by dumping him outside the city in the garbage fires of the Valley of Gehenna? Have they put him on display to further mock him? So, so she's distraught, and she runs back, and she blurts out this news to, P, uh, to Peter and John. And again, remember that John's writing this. He was the eyewitness. Now look at what happened, verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, that's, that's, the other disciple is John, he's talking about himself. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. These are interesting details. See, on hearing Mary's report, they both raced to the tomb. Maybe they were even still asleep when she burst in and woke them up with this news that the tomb was empty, that the body of Jesus was gone. And so they, they raced off to the tomb. Uh, I imagine John was younger and fitter. I imagine Peter, you know, I, I don't know why, but I just imagine John was, young and, was younger and fitter and taller. And I imagine Peter was a bit of a dumpy guy. You know, maybe a bit of a scruffy dude. And I can imagine, you know, Peter, you know, puffing, panting Peter, puffing, panting Peter, you know, hitting all, dum, 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 maybe a little boop and wobbling around, and he, he, he heads off, and John's, and John's ahead of him. And uh, they get to the tomb, and John puts the brakes on, and he looks in. And the next thing, Peter comes past him, whoo, and he goes straight in, you know. And, uh, Huh. I think that I may be wrong I don't think I am I think that Peter was the extrovert Peter was the A-type personality he was the adventuresome guy I think John was the introvert I identify more with John than with Peter and you probably identify more with one than the other that's, that, that's the way life is maybe, maybe just to comment here, a simple lesson, the different responses of these two, they, 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 they both loved Jesus, they both served him well, scripture gives recognition to both of them, and yet they were very, very different personalities, Peter was the extrovert, A-type personality, out there, in your face, quick to talk. John was the retiring introvert. They probably didn't always understand each other. They probably irritated each other. If you're an introvert and you're married to an extrovert, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and yet... They were both on Jesus' team, and he used them, and they needed each other. How good it is to remember that. Now, 
What did Peter see as he looked around the empty tomb? Look at the text. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up separate from the linen. So John clearly perceives these details as very important. And what they saw in Jesus' empty tomb was a, was a contrast to what had happened, and John had recorded it back in chapter 11, when, the, uh, when Lazarus was raised from the dead by Jesus. When Lazarus was raised, they had unwind all the burial cloths. You know, he was, he was wrapped up in all these uh, sort of bandages. When they go to the tomb of Jesus, what do they see? It's like a cocoon from which the, the moth has escaped or like a, a, a flat balloon where the air is gone. But it hasn't been taken apart. It hasn't been unwrapped except the, the, the part that was around the head was put there by itself. Significant. N.T. Wright says it looks as though the body wasn't picked up and unwrapped but had just disappeared leaving the empty cloths like a collapsed balloon when the air has gone out of it. Look at what happened next, verse 8. Finally, finally, and it sometimes takes us introverts a while to get with the program. Finally, the other disciple, that is John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. He hadn't yet seen the risen Christ. That would, that would only happen later that evening. He hadn't yet seen the risen Christ, but on the basis of the evidence, he believed. And later that evening, the others saw him. But John, like us, believed on the basis of evidence not on the basis of sight and sound and touch. One other thing that's worth mentioning here, another convincing proof of the validity of the testimony of Peter and John, is that they both ended up giving their lives for the message of the resurrection. If they had made it up, when it came to the crunch, and Peter was about to be crucified upside down in Rome, as tradition says he was, he could have said, whoa, guys, actually, actually, it didn't happen. I made it up. But he didn't do that. Nor did John. They died, as did many of the other disciples. They died for what they believed, based on eyewitness testimony. And later, verse 10 after Pentecost, after they'd received the gift of the Holy Spirit, they understood later that according to Scripture, Jesus had to rise from the dead. And so when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, this very same Peter who went into the tomb and saw the evidence, when he preached on the day of Pentecost, he understood then that Psalm 16, that he had known all his life as a good little Jewish boy, was a prophecy of the resurrection, as were many other Old Testament prophecies. So our king is alive, based on solid evidence. We could look at other evidence outside of the Gospel of John, but even just these 10 verses provide us with solid evidence of the resurrection. But our king is not only alive, and, and what I want to land with us this morning is the second part especially, because many of you believe in the resurrection. Now, you may not understand all the evidence or be able to argue it, but you, you believe in the resurrection. Probably wouldn't be at Easter Sunday service if you didn't believe in the resurrection. It's good to have a belief strengthened by evidence, but our king is also involved. And that's the message that we see in verses 11 to 29. 
And here we have the record of three encounters with the risen Lord. Stories of people who experienced the risen Lord in their lives in a way that changed their lives. And these stories, these three stories, are recorded for our encouragement so that we too, as, as modern-day disciples of Jesus, might experience something of the risen Lord in our lives. In the story of Mary Magdalene, which is the first story, the risen Lord changes her sorrow into joy. In the story of the disciples in lockdown, our risen Lord changes their confusion into mission. And in the story of Thomas, our risen Lord changes doubt into faith. Now, I want to read the stories quickly because you probably didn't have time to read them before you came this morning. Anybody? anybody? No, we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> this, this happened this morning, this Easter morning, and later in the evening, on Easter day. First of all, Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Look, read with me from verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. She obviously went back. Peter and John had hightailed it back there. Mary had come back, told them. They ran. She followed after them. They got there. She stood, out of the she stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. Put yourself in her sandals. As she wept, she leant over, bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. Whew. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Come back to that. He asked her, same question as the angels, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. I mean, that's, isn't that lovely? The love, the emotion. If you, I'll get him. You just tell me where he is. I'll, I'll go get him. Have it. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Do not hold on to me. That makes me think she threw her arms around him and hugged him. Not a bad thing to do. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Isn't that amazing? Sure. Now, verse 19, Jesus appears to the disciples. On the evening of the first day of the week. So Mary's encounter with him is in the morning. Now something's going to happen in the evening. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. That was his appearance, his encounter with the disciples. And then there's Thomas from verse 24. Look at it. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. We don't know where he was. Maybe he was just going to get a takeaway or something. 
Um, he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Unless my conditions are met, I will not believe. Unless you answer my questions to my intellectual satisfaction, I will not believe. Unless you, unless you can prove the resurrection scientifically, I will not believe. A week later, so now a week goes by. This is next Sunday. A week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked for the same reason, they were still bung. They were still afraid. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you, same as last Sunday. Then he said to Thomas, Try to imagine this. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. We make a big thing, and rightly so, of Peter's great confession in Matthew 16. This is Thomas's great confession in John 20. My Lord and my God. Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have, and that's us. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet have believed. Just a few general observations and then quick application, then I'm done. A few general observations about these resurrection stories I think will help us appreciate them but also apply them to our lives today and that's that's my heart for this this morning it's not I'm concerned about evidence evidence is critical but I'm also concerned about experience and encounter because if all you have of resurrection is an intellectual belief that it's true, you're missing something. Because part of the purpose in the resurrection is that we might have a living experience of Christ, the risen Christ in the here and now. So just some observations, taking these three stories together, and if we had time, we could grab the other accounts that the other gospel writers uh, record. In each case of the three we've looked at, the risen Lord took the initiative. Each time it says Jesus came to them. That's that's hugely encouraging. In each case, he came to them when, uh, to use Trevor Hudson's uh, expression, and I'll mention him in a minute, in each case, he came to people who were at the end of their rope. He came to Mary when she was heartbroken and grieving. He came to the disciples when they were afraid and confused and he came to Thomas when he was full of doubt and adamant that he wouldn't believe that's what Jesus loves doing coming to us when we're at the end of our rope I don't know what the end of your rope is but maybe some of you are at the end of, the, at the end of your rope I'm just, I'm just you're in a terrible place maybe like Mary you're grieving Maybe like the disciples, you're just totally confused and you're afraid. Maybe like Thomas, you're just skeptical. I don't know what this whole thing is about. Is it really a big deal? Thirdly, in each case, the, the, their recognition of him was gradual. It didn't sort of always happen just like that. You know, Mary, we don't, we don't know why, 
Uh, she first didn't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. But then she turned, and when she heard her name called, it clicked into place, and she knew who he was. But it didn't sort of, it, it, was, a, it was gradual. The, the disciples, he goes into that room, and, and twice he says to them, peace be with you, and then, and then shows them his hands, and then he says, peace be with you, and he sends them on a mission. So it's kind of a, a gradualness about it. Thomas, he hears about it from the others. He says, I'm not, I'm not going to believe. Uh, he's got a week to cook on it, and he's with these others, and they were probably having conversations, and, but he was, he was adamant. And then a week later, Jesus comes to him. And maybe that's kind of how it happens with us. We, we start out in one place, but over time we get to another place, and Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't sort of rush in on Monday morning and fix him. You know? He knew that Thomas, what Thomas had said, and Jesus leaves him for a week, and then, he, and then he comes to him. And maybe you're in that week where, you know, you said, I'm never going to believe. You know, okay. He says, I'll see you next week. <laughs> I love it. And then both Mary and the disciples were then commissioned to go and share the news of the resurrection. To Mary he said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them. Go and tell them. And so she went and said, The Lord is risen. He said to the disciples, As my Father has sent me, I am sending you. So he gives them the responsibility of sharing this message. Uh, John, uh, John Wilson, thank you, prayed for Irene. Irene is in hospital. She's in Morningside Clinic. Don't go and visit her. Um, she has shingles. And uh, she's uh, had an MRI yesterday. She's having a lumbar puncture today. Uh, she's been in a, a lot of distress. We took her to emergency on, on Friday night. But you know, I get a message from her. Five o'clock this morning. She says, I know you're awake. I was. <laughs> and she says, when you come to see me after church, please bring me 23 Easter eggs. <laughs> and uh, she said, the, 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 the staff and, uh, and uh, the and the patient's in her ward number 23, and she's got, she's got all these, you know, she's got a supply of these with her. We, she took a whole stack when she went, so she didn't need any more of these, but she needs 23 Easter eggs, and she'd already, five o'clock in the morning, she'd already spoken to one woman. She said, what, she said, what, what day is it today? And the lady said, it's, it's Easter. And uh, so they got talking, and this, this woman's from Limpopo. She's one of the nurses. And she said, my church in Limpopo is just finishing up. They've been praying all through the night, and they're just finishing their, their, their nighttime prayer meeting this morning. And he said, well, that's fantastic. A great idea for Ferndale next year, by the way. All night, <laughs> all night prayer meeting. And then she says to another lady, what's today? And the lady says, March 31st. <laughs> and Irene says, what is today? 31st of March. And she didn't know what Easter was. But now she does. See, that's what you do. You just, you just talk about it. You, you share about it. And that's what, that's what Mary did. That's what the disciples were commissioned to do. That's what Jesus says to us. As my Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, how might these stories apply to us? The risen Lord is not going to appear to us as he appeared to them in a glorified body that they could touch, that they could handle, that they could hear audibly. In another passage, they witnessed him eat. He asked them for some food and they gave him some fish to eat. He's not going to appear to us like that. So how, does he, how do we encounter him? How do we encounter him now? How do we experience him? How does he come to us? In that upper room discourse on Friday night in the upper room, John 14, he said this to them, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, 
For, listen to this. You know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, by that, did Jesus mean that, was he just talking about his bodily appearance to the, 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 the select group of up to 500 that Regan read about who witnessed him in his resurrection body? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because you remember the Great Commission, at, just before his ascension, when he, when he commissioned his disciples, he said to them, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so that obviously doesn't apply, didn't apply to his physical body when he made that, when he made that promise. I won't leave you as orphans, I will come to you. I am, I am. It's, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not even a promise, it's a declaration. He doesn't say, I will be with you. He doesn't say, I promise to be with you. He says, I am with you. I remember hearing about, I think there were two, two Irish preachers who were having a discussion about that text. And the one uh, said to the other one, ah, isn't that a wonderful promise? And the other one replied, no, it's not a promise, it's a statement of fact. <laughs> it's not a promise. Jesus is stating a fact. I am with you always to the end of the age. So how is he with us? He comes to us, the risen Lord comes to us now by the Holy Spirit. That's how he comes. Trevor Hudson, great Methodist pastor and friend of mine, just written, he's written many books. He's in, a newer one is called Seeking God. And in chapter 7, on, it's, it's called Experiencing Resurrection Joy. Let me just give you a couple of quotes, then I'm going to wrap it up. Listen to this. Sometimes, he says, sometimes we live on the wrong side of Easter. We live as though Jesus did not rise from the grave. When we live as though Jesus did not rise from the grave, discipleship easily degenerates into heavy-hearted efforts to try harder and harder to follow Jesus. And then he says, the resurrection is not only a, do a theological doctrine, it is an invitation to an encounter with the living Jesus in which he shares us, himself with us, in which we share ourselves with him, listen to what he might say, and partner with him in making God's compassion more visible in the world. And then he says the resurrection is God's way of being with us in every moment, wherever we are. Through this event, the now risen and ever-loving Christ says to each of us, let me breathe my spirit into you so that you may know now that I live within you. The resurrection declares that Jesus has not stopped listening, speaking, and acting. He is alive and at large in our world, in the places where we live, love, and work, and we can join him there. Jesus' story continues in you and me. Isn't that glorious? And then this last one. As we keep, this, as we keep one foot in our imagination, nation in our imaginative contemplation in the gospel narratives and the other foot in our everyday lives, we will notice how the risen Lord slips into our lives. I love Trevor's image, his choice of words there. As we are anchored in these historical accounts, of people like us experiencing the risen Lord, as we are anchored there, and as we're living in our real world of today, what yours looks like and what mine looks like, we will notice how the risen Lord slips into our lives. I thought, I thought about that this week. How the risen Lord slips into our lives. He doesn't... He doesn't barge into our lives like a rhino crashing through the bush 
I mean, sometimes he does that, but most of the time, that's not the way he works. He slips into our lives kind of like a, like a shadow, like a gentle breeze reminding us of a scripture, nudging us to do a good deed, prodding us about a sin we need to confess or something we need to put right, assuring us of his love, saying peace to us when we're in the midst of a, of a storm, enabling us to, to glimpse his glory in creation. I had that this morning in the strangest way. I was cutting a slice of lemon to put in water to have on my desk sometime after five o'clock this morning. And as I sliced that lemon, I mean, ever look at a slice of lemon? I mean, flip. You cannot look at a slice of lemon and not believe in an amazing creator. I mean, good night. From that seed, it grows into a tree that produces lemons. And in the skin, in the rind of the lemon, are these little segments. And in each segment, there are these little, little pouches containing lemon juice. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> There's not a God. <laughs> I, I, I stood there at my kitchen counter this morning. It was as if the risen Lord was standing there and he said, I made that, aren't I cool? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you've got to have those, you've got to have those lemon slice moments. Yeah, all over the place. There are lemon slice moments everywhere. They're here. And, and, and the risen Lord wants us to just, he just wants to say, hey, let's enjoy that together. I made that. And so you can, you can live your life in, in lemon slice moments instead of just going on. See, that, that's what he, that he's, he's made it for us. All things were made by him and for him and, and for us. And he slips into us sometimes when we're listening to a sermon. Maybe that's happened to you this morning. The risen Lord has slipped in his word and you've heard him and you've felt him and you've sensed that he's been making himself known to you. Yeah, that's, that's what he does. About 18 months ago, I was spending time with a man whose surname was Thomas and he was a serious doubter brilliant retired surgeon dying of, of a brain tumor and I started meeting with him and he had all the arguments in the world as to why Christianity was a lot of junk and we just started talking and one day I was going to see him and I as I was driving as I was getting out of my study to go I said Lord I don't know what I'm going to say to him that I haven't said many times before and it was as if the thought came to mind which I know was the risen Lord putting it there tell him the, tell him the story tell him the parable of the workers in the vineyard and I did walk through it with him and that was the beginning of him coming to Christ. And one day the Lord slipped into his life. And with me, I wasn't even there. He called his wife and he said, get that little book that Lee gave me and turn to the little prayer in the back. And he said, I want to pray it. And he prayed that prayer, committing his life to Christ. A few weeks later, I conducted his funeral and all his fellow 
medical gurus from all around Johannesburg were there and they heard his story of the Lord slipping into his life. So there we go. That's what he did. He slipped into Mary's grief and changed it to joy. He slipped into the disciples' fear and changed it to mission. He slipped into Thomas's doubt and changed them to faith. And uh, he wants to slip in to your life on this resurrection day. Speak your name, Mary, whatever. And you'll turn toward him and say, Lord, and it'll change. So, let me end with this. Don't you think it's time to begin living on the right side of Easter? Don't you think it's time to start living on the right side of Easter? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are alive. We believe because of the evidence, but we also believe because of our encounter with you. Thank you for your initiative. Thank you for the way you, you slip into our lives. I pray that you would have done that and that this would not be something that occurs occasionally, but it would occur often in all of our lives. Help us to live resurrection, to live on the right side of Easter. Amen.